Okay, so welcome to uh, Cornell Agroforestry Program Work Team uh, webinar series for 2021. My name is Steve Gabriel. I'm one of the co-chairs of the Program Work Team, which is essentially a collection of individuals across the Cornell community who are curious and passionate and excited about agroforestry. And some of us uh, do this on the side of our, our main appointments, and some of us it's the focus of our research or our educational efforts. So it's a wide ranging group of folks interested in things like maple syrup, in mushrooms, in nuts, in grazing animals, in the woods as in silvopasture, all sorts of different ways that trees can be integrated into uh, the farm and, and the landscape as a whole. So our website, um, you can find it, the Cornell Small Farm Program hosts this website. You can find it through the Small Farms Program website, which is smallfarms.cornell.edu. You can also just quickly, um, type in cornellagroforestry.org and it'll go right to this homepage, which is essentially a portal to all things agroforestry associated with Cornell. We do have a listing of the webinars that we've offered this year at the top of the page, including links to the recordings for all the previous webinars. This webinar will be available at that link. Uh, and you can click on that and go right to the YouTube channel. We have one more webinar for 2021 scheduled in November about um, the Maple program, and they're going to provide a nice update on their research for, for what they found in the, in the previous season. And I'll just mention then as you scroll down, you'll find some background information and some links to reports looking at um, relationship of agroforestry and climate change, because that's a big proponent. That's a sort of a big feature of agroforestry, I'd say. Um, the relationship of agroforestry as uh, embedded in indigenous knowledge um, and, and some resources there to look at. And I know Samantha's going to touch on that today. And then each of our kind of program areas, you'll find a section that's basically going to give you some resources and links to um, where you might find more. So for the woodland mushrooms, it also repoints you to our Cornell Mushroom Project page. Same with the maple program and things like that. And so you'll find um, we have mushrooms, maple syrup, uh, ginseng resources. There was a webinar last month about that, civil pasture, and nuts, of course, which is what we're going to talk about today. Our program also does have a forestry project. Peter Smallage is the director of that, and so there's some resources there because if we're talking about trees, then we're also going to be talking about forests and forest management. So you can check that all out at cornellagroforestry.org. So I'm going to stop my share and encourage Samantha to join us and welcome you to share with us about all things nuts. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Okay, I'm just gonna share my screen. Okay. Hi, everyone, and welcome. My name is Samantha Bosco, and I am a sixth year PhD candidate at uh, the horticulture department at Cornell University. I'm also on the agroforestry program work team and a 2021 Phipps Conservatory Bot Botany in Action Fellow. And I'm here to talk to you about uh, we're going to take a, a, a survey through time and space um, and species and learn all about what, you know, nuts in the, in the, the deep history and future. So I am connecting to you from Gallego or Cayuga land, which is part of the uh, Haudenosaunee Confederacy, also known as the Iroquois Confederacy. Um, and I just want to recognize that um, many of the species we're talking about today are from here. Uh, these are indigenous plants and they have deep relationships with indigenous peoples um, and Cornell University. And yeah, and so that's just a really important thing to, to foreground. Also, so here's a map of the same territory, different scale, but I also want to recognize how so much of this land has been stolen from indigenous uh, control and, and use. Um, the Haudenosaunee now have less than 0.1% of control of their land. Um, and here I am in Ithaca, New York, Cornell University, which um, has, of all the land grant institutions in this country, has benefited the greatest um, financially from the sale of dispossessed indigenous land. And so something that's really important to me in the work that I do is that I'm trying to envision and help create new forms of sustainable agriculture, um, but not only in terms of ecological sustainability, but I really I think it's important that we really think hard about ways that we can leverage social justice as a really important integral part of any kind of future, um, uh, any kind of future, especially if we're talking about agriculture um, on in indigenous territory, 
at this university, um, it's really important that we address uh, this past and try to find better ways of making a future. So if you're really curious more about this, I really encourage you all to go to landgrabu.org and to learn about the really, um, really fascinating and sordid past of the land grant system. So we're taking a deep, deep uh, survey through time. I also want to present a kind of a disclaimer that this talk is going to be covering a lot of different subjects and a lot of different time frames, and so it's not going to be uh, comprehensive. It's not going to be perfect. You might know more about me about something. Um, and or I might have gotten something wrong because I'm doing a quick survey and I definitely encourage folks to chat with me afterwards. This is also not going to be really focused on, on like production of nut trees in a commercial sense. I do have another webinar about that that I can include a link to at the end of this. Um, I will talk a little bit about producing nuts, but it's not going to be focused on like how do you grow nuts the best. Um, again, this is about past, present and future of nuts in this landscape. So 10,000 years ago, we have um, we have a recently deglaciated landscape. Uh, glaciers have receded um, through uh, global warming, and as a result, at this time, there just there are no trees on the landscape. And so 10,000 years ago, nut trees don't really they don't exist here. We're looking at archaeological data, and this comes from looking at like fossilized pollen data. We see that as as early as 6,000 years ago. The nut trees that we know of today uh, were already here, so it didn't take very long after that deglaciation for nut trees to migrate north. Um, you'll see the darker green circles up here in more of our zone. Uh, we have species like uh, sorry, genuses like caria, which is our hickories. We have Quercus, which is our oaks. Our Coralis, our hazelnuts, and Fagus, which is our beech nut. And then more of this mid-Atlantic zone, we have the castanea, which is the chestnut, and juglans are walnuts. So that's 6,000 years ago. Um, and as I just said, this is uh, the kind of the, the, the range of the, the diversity of nuts that we have here. We have um, all these different nuts. Most of them are, are come from oaks. And of course, all of these are really capable of interspecific hybrid, 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 forming hybrids um, between different species in the same genus. So while we might have these two or like few species in some of these uh, families, they're also the potential for genetic diversity is huge. And that is something that is being um, exploited today for really good things. And it's a way in which we can, um, it's just an exciting way of, of how these trees can adapt to changing times. One of the really important impacts or one of the important, really important qualities that nut trees have that give them such important impacts in landscapes and ecologies and in human uh, cultures is how nutritious they are. Um, nuts are unparalleled in terms of the nutrition, especially when you're looking at different forms of plant foods. Um, in particular, they have exceptionally high amounts of polyunsaturated fats, which are extremely healthy for us, uh, at least for humans in particular. And as, and as far as plants go, there's really not many plants that have this kind of ratio of, of uh, fats and protein. And so this is like one of the most important aspects of nuts, not only ecologically, but how they can fit into creating healthier food systems and more sustainable food systems in the future. Another really interesting aspect that, of nut trees that impacts how they um, have shaped uh, different ecologies is that they do this thing called masting. And masting is the overabundance of, of trees in a non-predictable but, um, but uh, periodic way. So this graph on the left, each one of those little subgraphs is a different nut tree. And these are not necessarily from the, um, from the Northeast. These actually, I think, are from around the world. But these show over a period of, looks like um, six years, the different frequency, the y-axis is number of nuts produced. And so it shows you how different nut trees have different ways of masting. Some of them do it like kind of evenly throughout and some do it like once a decade. And this has really uh, powerfully shaped the ecologies in the Northeast, not only in terms of the way that mammals have um, subsist on them, but also this uh, graph on the other side of the uh, of the slide here also shows how this also impacts cycles of of diseases such as Lyme disease. And so nuts are just like because of their nutrition 
And because of the way that they act nutty from time to time, they just have these really powerful impacts on our ecosystems. And when trying to reconstruct the past, especially in the ways in which um, people have been using nuts, we have to look to a very um, challenging and interesting form of data, which are charred nutshells. Uh, and this is our the cl most clearest evidence we have of what we call paleoethnobotany. Ethnobotany is the way that humans use plants, paleo being how they did this in um, you know before the written record. And so um, these charred nut remains are often left behind after some kind of cultural event, whether um, indigenous peoples were fire roasting nuts or they were discarding uh, the nut shells in a fire. And then um, through incomplete combustion, these are not turned to ashes. They're just basically carbonized nut shells. They are very, very persistent in the soil. And so when archaeologists are doing excavations, um, this is one of the things, at least that paleo archaeologists, I'm, not, I'm sorry, that um, but uh, archaeo archaeobotanists will look for for the, a long long history in of archaeology archaeologists did not care anything about plants and so unfortunately the archaeological record is really challenging to work with because it's, it's also very highly biased um, some of the earlier records only care about stone tools um, and then a lot of folks who work on paleo um, paleo are really focused on domesticates like corn and so nuts um, they come and go in the record and we have an incomplete picture of them. And I'm hoping that in my research that I will be able to give a little bit more, um, look a little bit more critically about what, you know, how people have used nut trees in the Northeast in the past. One of the most important archeological sites in New York state comes from a place called Lamoka Lake, which is just Southeast of Cayuga Lake. That's not, that's Cayuga, not Cayuga, in between Seneca and Cayuga Lake. And this archaeological site in particular was has been look, uh, based on the deposition there looks like it has been occupied between the years 5000 and 2000 BCE. Um, and one site there in particular, or one of the, um, the features in that site came from about the year 3000 BCE. So that's about 5000 years before today. Um, and, and what's really important about the site is that when archaeologists found the site, they found the site in the 1960s. And this was for the very first time that there was archaeological evidence that indigenous peoples existed this far into the past. So before this, archaeologists thought that indigenous peoples were a relatively recent addition to the landscape here. Um, and, and, and they use that as ways to um, to justify the dispossession. Um, but this site totally un overturned previous notions of uh, the population history in, in like what is today New York State. And some of the remarkable things that were found here was a gigantic, gigantic acorn roasting bed. I'm talking like 30 feet long, uh, 10 feet wide and three feet deep of just charred acorns, um, ashes, also hickory nuts and also a collection of these specialized stone tools that you see in the black and white picture that are used for processing plant material. And so this is like one of the best known examples of, of nut production or nut use in New York state. Unfortunately, at least currently, like there's no other site, there's no, has been no other finds quite like this. And so it makes, it, it kind of begs the question, have, has use of nuts gone down over time? Has it stayed the same, but we just can't find them? These are kind of unanswered questions in archaeology. Jumping forward several thousand years, uh, there's another really amazing um, uh, archaeological site called Dunsfort, and this is in the southwest corner of Pennsylvania. So not quite the northeast, but it's still neighborly enough to be, and I think uh, interesting enough to be included here. So this comes from about 560 uh, BC, and this is a gigantic um, almost the same dimensions and size, but a wa black walnut processing station. Uh, this was not like a year-round village. This was a very, a very specialized uh, site that had um, uh, this, uh, this bottom picture here where my cursor is. This feature was a gigantic like fire roasting bed. It's 15 meters wide, so it's about 50 feet long, uh, filled with uh, burnt rocks and uh, black walnut shells. They also have evidence of these um, specialized tools um, 
And some of these, these look like uh, projectile points, but the archaeologists are very puzzled by them because they don't have the same um, kind of dimensions that are like efficient for, um, for like killing animals. And a lot of them were found amongst the, um, the charred rocks and acorn, uh, black walnut shells. And a lot of the tips were broken off. So they kind of hypothesize that these might be um, nut extraction tools. But again, this is just a hypothesis. We were not there at the time. So it's hard for us to kind of like put these things together. And then if we look into the ethnographic record, so later on, we're able to actually rec record what people thought. Um, a lot of these were recorded by uh, Europeans or um, people in Euro-American culture. And so I just want to share a couple of these to exemplify how folks were writing about nuts at different time periods. So this first quote comes from Arthur Parker, who was a Seneca archaeologist, worked for the New York State Museum, uh, was for a period of time the New York State archaeologist. And he uh, wrote a whole book about um, Iroquois plant use. Iroquois, of course, is the antiquated word for the Haudenosaunee, um, but saying that nuts were an important part of the Iroquois diet. Great quantities were consumed during the nut season and quantities were stored for winter use. The nut season to the Iroquois was one of the happiest periods of the year. F.W. Waugh, which is another um, ethnologist who is someone who studies culture, uh, which is like a branch of, of anthropology working around the same time, you know, said very similar things about there being a very uh, a variety of nuts that are met within the Iroquois country. Uh, many were not only eaten raw, but they were also incorporated to many different other foods. And at present, they're usually cracked and eaten as a treat during winter. And then one of my favorite quotes comes from the Jesuit uh, Relations, which is a collection of documents of Jesuit missionaries in the 16 and 1700s, or even earlier. And one in particular, Father Fremen, who was trying to proselytize and convert the Seneca, um, was complaining um, to the scribe in this year, 1669, this happened to be a very um, abundant mast year and uh, was saying that one sees only everywhere games, dances, and feasts, which often reach the point of debauchery. So I really love here that nuts were not only a really vibrant part of indigenous food systems, but also part of indigenous resistance to colonization. And I really hope that that's something that we can take with us um, into the future. In the mid 20th century, uh, the Rochester Museum commissioned a Seneca painter by the name of Ernest Smith to not only share oral accounts of very, uh, various aspects of Haudenosaunee life, but also paint them. And so he, he produced many, many paintings. You can find the, the, there's a digital repository for these on the Rochester Museum. Uh, two of them in particular have to do with the way that nuts were either processed or harvested. Here one's called Making Hickory Nut Oil and the other one is gathering chestnuts. So this is just a collection of uh, different um, points of evidence, different kinds of evidence that show how important and how diverse uh, nut consumption and processing was to indigenous people through their eyes. And so um, this leads me to an another thing, which is that the way that indigenous people used land was very different to the ways that the Euro-Americans that came and settled thought that land should be used, especially when it comes to nut trees and the indigenous forms of agroforestry, the ways in which people, indigenous people managed forests for the intentional production of things like nut trees um, was seen by, and they use things like fire and of course, wild harvesting. Those kinds of, those kinds of techniques and strategies were seen by your Americans as savage and wasteful and um, was punishable by dispossession, death, robbery, all these, um, you know, all these kind of hallmarks of settler colonialism. A lot of historical ecologists working today are uncovering how the, the forests that we see today, they're really just fingerprints of indigenous land use and the, our notions of, of conservation and the way that forests quote unquote should look is actually based off of incorrect notions of conservation, um, you know, which is all rooted in settler colonial um, anti-indigenous racism. And so what we can see, for instance, uh, one of the a re really huge landmark papers came out in 2017, which was that parts of the Amazon forests uh, looked at through this lens could actually be seen as gigantic food forests, these certain parts of them. Also in uh, the Pacific Northwest, 
some really amazing, uh, this, this researcher here, Chelsea Geralda Armstrong is a colleague of mine, a mentor of mine. She does really amazing um, historical, ecological and archeological research um, showing how within a certain distance to known uh, indigenous sites that the structure and species distribution of forests um, is like really significantly impacted to have a higher degree of, of like edible and medicinal plants compared to uh, parts of the forest beyond like further outside of traditional uh, indigenous use. This has been uh, shown in more broadly the Eastern US. And then uh, these two papers here um, coming out of Buffalo University, some historical ecologists working there uh, showing, um, actually doing uh, ecological modeling um, and showing how the, the forests that we see today in, you know, in Western New York have been shaped by uh, indigenous peoples to have a higher degree of nut producing species than what, what kind of should be there considering the ecology elsewhere. So we call this, these call these cultural landscapes. This has also been hypothesized with the presence of black walnut um, in Haudenosaunee landscapes. And so this map shows the range map, the typical range map for, for black walnut. And if uh, you look up at where we are in New York, you see these like five or six uh, blobs, discontinuous blobs. And this is very strange behavior for a tree, especially with a very heavy nut, you know, these nuts um, should have like a very even spread throughout uh, the territory that they're able to, um, to take root in. And so it's been thought that, you know, because of the shape of this and because of other historical accounts, that there's likely a hypothesis is that indigenous international trade routes have helped bring black walnut out of its, uh, you know, typical range into some more northerly parts where it wasn't able to um, take root naturally. For reference, like the Dunsford site, major black walnut processing site here in lower um, southeastern Pennsylvania. But of course, there's also, you know, along the, um, this kind of golden triangle area is a very, has a very mild climate. So this is, has us thinking. And then here is some uh, data uh, from one of those papers out in Western New York. That, that triangulates lots of different kinds of data. For instance, they, what they were looking at was um, something called the Ogden Purchase. And this was the Ogden Land Company um, in the 1700s, uh, 1795, bought all of Western New York illegally. And uh, as they were like looking to carve it up into different places to sell to other landowners, they did all these surveys, these tree surveys, as they were like making these neat squares of like what counties would be what. And they, and they made note of all the different trees along the transects. And so these researchers looked through those, um, those records. They saw what trees were listed there. They also noted if um, sometimes the people who were doing the land surveys noted that there's evidence of fire or that there was like strange, like lone trees, you know, like all of New York pretty much should just be a vast forest. But sometimes there were these trees that were all alone in the landscape, something we call oak savannas, um, which are like, very low density population of trees. A lot of them tend to be oak trees or other very fire tolerant species and all the nut producing species are very fire tolerant. And so they put together an ecological model that um, uh, kind of triangulated all the different forms of evidence also including known indigenous use sites. And so the areas that are darker and gray, there's a much, much higher likelihood in those areas that indigenous peoples were using fire um, to manage and produce these oak savannas, which would have created these cultural landscapes um, that produced a lot of really amazing food. However, since um, Euro colonial invasion, and as they use the land and they did, we have a huge, um, huge degree of deforestation in the Northeast. Uh, some parts of Cortland County, it's kind of maybe hard to see on your screen, but this little blip here, this very light, um, this like, pale yellow color is Cortland County, where by 1910 had was less than 5% wooded after being um, ostensibly 100% wooded. Um, and this is a form of what we call indigenous erasure or settler replacement, where the settler colonists came and they clear cut the forest and put up their farms um, and were just basically like doing settler colonial things on indigenous land. And so a lot of the evidence of indigenous use and the legacy of indigenous use has just literally been erased from the landscape. Of course, um, we'd have to talk, you know, any uh, conversation about nut trees in the Northeast and in, in history 
we'd have to talk about the chestnut and the chestnut was a tree that was loved by both indigenous people and European uh, settlers. Um, I'm not gonna go too much into the history of here because it's, it's a very told story, but just to say that it was such an iconic tree that was had such a major, major impact on the ecosystem. I'll get a little bit later into you know, what caused its demise, uh, be, that being the chestnut blight and some things that are happening today um, to, help, to help get around this or to sort of revive a chestnut culture. But the chestnut was a, a huge, huge loss. And the forests that we have today are basically like chestnut graveyards. Um, sometimes you can still see um, the, uh, the stumps, the dead stumps or root sprouts as the chestnuts, they're not actually dead. Uh, they are functionally extinct, but they have their roots are still living underground and will, you know, every so often send up shoots to try to, you know, try to keep living. But since the, the fungal blight is persistent and has other hosts, um, by the time the, the, tr the chestnut sprouts reach about, you know, their reproduction age, they tend to succumb to the blight. Just like, um, just like trees, the nut trees mast, there's been cycles of interest and disinterest in nut trees throughout uh, our US history. In the early 1900s, uh, there was sort of a, a huge interest in nuts. And around the 20th century, there's some really fascinating publications um, that really extol the, the, the profound importance of nut trees and how much they can benefit, how much we could benefit from planting them on like roadsides and things like that. Uh, but at this time, about 75% of the nuts produced in the U.S. are of European or Asian origin. And that really limits the degree, like the geography of where they can be produced. Also, um, J. Russell Smith in 1914 produced Tree Crops, which is one of the most like foundational um, uh, books, in it, especially for like modern agroforestry. And we owe a lot of people's interest um, in and, and knowledge about how to how to grow these trees and how to just like thinking about different kinds of agriculture agriculture based on per perennial trees that are more suited towards more challenging landscapes like rocky slopes acidic soils um, we owe a lot to J Russell Smith for for po popularizing these ideas and he was a really big part of the um, the Roosevelt administration part of the the public works program and helping to actually get wind breaks on across the United States landscapes during the Dust Bowl. Um, and so agroforestry in the United States like really has its roots in uh, as a way of saving this ecological disaster, which was really brought upon combination of a historic drought and really poor land use from excessive plowing. There's so many different people, interesting people um, who have been doing different kinds of nut breeding throughout the United States. Um, and there's no way I could cover all of them. And since this is a Cornell sponsored talk, I wanted to definitely talk, touch a little bit upon a Cornell's um, legacy in this. And George Slate was a, a very prolific and important breeder who worked at the Geneva uh, Agricultural Experiment Station and uh, for about uh, 48 years. And um, did actually, amongst many other things, did a lot of hazelnut breeding. Unfortunately, his work has all been destroyed. It's not there anymore. Uh, he produced this, uh, this little pamphlet in 1941. And, and it uh, shows some of the different cultivars that he was growing. And I just want to point out two of them. Uh, this one called Winkler, number 14, uh, was a very cold, hardy selection of, of the American uh, hazelnut, which was found in Iowa. And that has been, and there, there's like a whole lineage of hazelnut breeding out in the upper Midwest right now that is like based on uh, that particular selection. Um, and then also number 13 here, Rush, which is a selection of American uh, hazelnut came from a very good nut quality producing uh, plant in Pennsylvania. And this uh, particular selection is still being used today um, well, first George Slate made uh, several crosses with this. So he crossed it with the uh, European hazelnut to produce um, New York 616, which is called Slate and New York 3898, which is called Jean or Geneva. And New York 616 is still being used today to produce high quality uh, disease resistant plants. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that later on in the talk. We also of course have Lawrence McDaniels who in the 1930s established the Nut Grove at Cornell, 
which is a really fascinating collection of plants and outdoor classroom. Um, he also produced a really amazing compendium of uh, a nut knowledge in 1941. Uh, very simply called nut growing, which includes uh, information about all these different species, but also detailed information on how, how to graft them and how to plant them. And the nut grove has very recently been used as an outdoor classroom by folks like Steve Gabriel and Professor Emeritus Ken Munch, um, who used to co-teach uh, agroforestry practicum out there. Uh, hopefully that space can continue to be used, but right now it's the only like living legacy of of a lot of the network being that has been done at Cornell. And another really notable person is John Hershey, who planted a, an incredible, incredible amount of, of different selections and graphs of not only nuts, but, uh, but fruits in Pennsylvania um, for was for one, uh, one period of time known as the number one tree crop farm. And unfortunately today, um, this land has been sold and is being subdivided into like a little suburbia. These trees are being cut down. Um, a lot of really amazing uh, nursery people around the country, especially the Northeast, have been going here and, uh, and stealing stealing fruits and seeds and, and taking cuttings and trying to uh, save what, what's left of here. But this is a really important source of genetics that, that people are still using today. And so um, kind of through, this is sort of like a very broad brushstroke of like what, nut production sort of looks like today. What we have on the West Coast, a lot of hazelnut production and, and almond production, pistachio walnuts. These are not black walnuts. These are um, uh, Juglans regia, the European or Carpathian walnuts. Um, the US South is a huge production center for the pecan. The pecan is currently the only native nut that it really has commercial presence. Uh, they, they export so many to Canada, to China, other parts of the, of the world. Um, the Midwest has a really good hold on black walnut production, but it's very niche. It's very small production. It's like, you know, one tenth or less of what's being produced elsewhere in terms of nut production. And so my question is like, given the, the extensive history of nut production in the, of, in the Northeast, why is there nothing going on in the Northeast? Um, it's really not that simple. And I'll show you that there actually is quite a lot going on. Um, and that's what we'll get into right now. And so I'm going to focus on two species of nuts or two, um, two generous really, um, the chestnuts and the hazelnuts. Chestnuts are found all across the world, uh, really actually like in the, in the Northern hemisphere. There are about nine, eight to nine species of them, depending on how you define a species. It says that they're wind pollinated, but their uh, chestnuts are also actually very, it's very recently been kind of confirmed that their uh, insect pollination is really important for them too. And really importantly, they form interspecific hybrids, which means that different species can pollinate each other and produce viable seeds. If you're looking to grow chestnuts, uh, really, especially in the Northeast, you're gonna be looking at growing Chinese chestnuts, which is Castanea mollissima, or Japanese chestnuts, Castanea crenata, or hybrids. Um, hybrids can include either of those Asian species and also um, the European species, Castanea sativa. Uh, Castanea sativa won't really do that well on its own here, especially for its, um, uh, it's not really well uh, resistant to the, um, I'm sorry, cold hardy enough to, to uh, survive up here. Chestnuts really love well-drained soils. And so people typically plant them on slopes. This also helps with frost drainage, even though they're pretty cold hardy. Um, we can get W temperatures that do get below negative 20 degrees Fahrenheit in this area. So slopes are really great for them and acidic soils are really great for them. So chestnuts really do well on marginal, on marginal land. They're also pretty drought tolerant after, um, especially after establishment. Uh, you can, of course, if you're going to be planting them, can go one of two ways. And one of these is planting seedlings. Seedlings is, are super affordable to plant. They can be completely free or they can have a very low cost if you buy them from a nursery. They're, very, they're much faster to establish than, um, there's like less uh, establishment shock than compared to planting grafts. Uh, some of the benefits and the drawbacks, you have a huge genetic, genetic diversity. So this can be both good and bad, depending on what you want. On the downside, it can give you very variable yield and also very variable survivability in terms of resistance to chestnut blight. And so if you're gonna be planting a commercial orchard out of 
uh, seedling or uh, seedling chestnuts, you're going to, have to do a lot of thinning. It's very possible. Uh, this picture uh, here is from a chestnut orchard in Ohio that I visited. It's all based on Chinese chestnut seedlings. And one of their major management strategies is to just cull, cull, cull all the ones that they don't like. And um, after a lot of intensive selection, they have really great, very successful chestnut production. Another obvious um, potential is also, you could also go with clonal cultivars. Most of the clones either come are, are mostly in, are grafted. And some of the challenges with grafted cultivars is that a lot of them experience something called delayed graft failure, um, which like five to 10 years after um, growing really nicely, this, the graft dies. And then you're no, then the, the chestnut will still survive in the root sprouts, but you know, the fancy cultivar that you grafted on top is just gone. And so you kind of paid a lot of money for, for nothing much. There is a lot of really great um, advances happening with uh, tissue culturing, especially for uh, some of the, the hybrid cultivars. And so I believe that micropropagation is gonna really help, um, really help with uh, chestnut production, commercial chestnut production in the near future. Um, I'm not gonna go too much into this. If you're really interested in chestnut production, do see my other uh, webinar that I've given, but I just will say that this, uh, a lot of, if you're really interested in like commercial production of chestnuts, look to um, the Michigan State University. They have a really great dedicated extension and research program. Um, and, and what we're just showing here is that um, you're gonna wanna choose some cultivars to primarily be your, uh, for, for donating pollen and some of them to be for production of actual nuts. Uh, some of the production cultivars are, uh, they don't produce any pollen or pollen sterile. And so they put a lot of uh, energy into producing nuts. And yeah, you can predict about, you know, at maturity, about 2000 pounds per acre at 50 final spacing at 50 trees per acre. And you're probably waiting between five to nine years before getting a crop of chestnuts. Of course, one of the major uh, management issues is the chestnut blight, and it is a fungal pathogen that's from Asia, first discovered in New York City in 1904 at the Bronx Zoo. Um, and it has, as I mentioned before, caused the functional extinction of the American chestnut. Asian chestnuts, since they have been co-evolving with, uh, with this fungus, they have uh, what we call multi-gene resistance. There's like multi, uh, it's a quantitative resistance, and there's and so they have a there's a lot of different genetic resistances to, um, to the to the blight. Um, yeah, and so if you want to be planting them, you're just like gonna definitely be wanting to make sure that you choose time tested material from known cult cultivars that are known to be resistant to the blight. Um, if you have blighted trees, you're gonna want to cull the whole tree or prune the infected branches, and of course, sanitize your tools uh, before and after you do so. And one of the hallmarks of the disease is this orange discoloration and this sunken appearance of the actual tree. Because what's happening is that, as I'll, I'll get into here, um, is that the, um, the fungus exudes oxalic acid, which reduces the pH in the plant to about two and a half, which basically dissolves the plant tissue. That's really where the damage comes from. And so one of the, uh, uh, in addition to a lot of really amazing uh, breeding efforts being done to breed the American chestnut with the different resistant Asian species, um, there's also a very new um, development at the SUNY ESF, the uh, College for Environmental Science and Forestry in Syracuse, where they've produced um, transgenic chestnuts that are resistant to the blight. I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about what they've been up to. So as I said before, there's up to seven genes that are responsible for the blight, the blight resistance in the Asian species. And this is really hard for back crossing efforts. It's really hard to get all seven genes into an American species that also has a lot of characteristics of the American chestnut and also has the nut qualities you're looking for and the cold hardiness. It's just like a, lot, a very, very a huge challenge for breeding. And so as I just already mentioned, chestnut blight is really caused by one one thing in particular, and that's the production of oxalic, oxalic acid by this fungus, which basically dissolves the plant tissues and kills the tree. Interestingly enough, 
there is a naturally pr uh, produced enzyme that's very common in both wild and crop plants. It's called oxalic acid oxidase. And it basically turns oxalic acid into hydrogen peroxide and carbon dioxide, two very benign uh, molecules. And so what uh, folks at SUNY ESF did is that they use agrobacterium, which is a naturally founding bacteria um, that exists out in the world. And they were able to um, control it in order to take us uh, this uh, this gene for uh, OXO is very common in wheat. And so they were able to use the agrobacterium to insert the single gene into the chestnut to the American chestnut genome. And they uh, did lots of different trials and it's and the, the transformed trees show resistance to the blight that is equal to that of Asian species. Another thing that's uh, really important like a benefit to this approach is that um, this gene is uh, has really great inheritance, and so if you cross a transformed chestnut with a wild chest, a wild American chestnut, half the progeny will have this in, um, will have inherited this gene. And uh, one of the other benefits is that it doesn't put any selective pressure on the fungus, so the fungus is not going to um, co-evolve and evolve a more virulent strain. It's just the, the fungus can keep living and existing on the chestnut, but it just no longer hurts the tree. And these pictures are just some side-by-side -side comparisons um, showing how the tree has been able to, the transformed tree has been able to heal the wound. And so if you're someone who's really interested in preserving the genetics of the American chestnut in particular, so if you're really um, interested in this as like a wildlife restoration project, and you're really interested in genetic preservation, this approach is a lot more effective in that sense um, than trying to back cross and create hybrids. Um, I wouldn't say you're not necessarily gonna produce trees that are like good for farming in this way, but this is, has a very different purpose in different place. So I just wanted to give some information about transgenic trees because you may, all may have heard about those. Chestnuts have a number of other considerations. Again, I'm not gonna go too much into this, um, but a lot of these are taken care of by by careful selection of cultivars and management. Some of these issues are still very new and we're learning a lot about them, like blossom end rot. Um, two important insect pests to be aware of are the Asian chestnut gall wasp and the chestnut weevil. Both have very different management aspects to them. Both are present in this area. And if you're gonna be growing chestnuts, you should definitely be learning about these. Another um, really interesting issue Issue that came out of the experience out of Michigan was this it's basically a genetic disease called internal caudal breakdown and they they are hypothesizing that um, this happens when if you have a, um, a Japanese European hybrid such as the cultivar called colossal and it gets pollinated by a Chinese chestnut it's going to get this disease called internal kernel breakdown where despite there being an absence of um, um, of microorganisms like fungi or bacteria, the nut just sort of starts to decompose, um, you know, while it's being stored in harvest, so post-harvest. So that's just really a management choice to not mix those two different kinds of plant materials. And of course, uh, we have to talk about how um, chestnuts get turned into food. And so there's a, a, this is a very simplified process chain. Uh, what's really nice about chestnuts is that it's very easy to just sell them fresh to people. That's how most people want them. But of course, they can also be turned into a variety of value-added products. And some really nice things that you can, and I call this the bread tree because uh, chestnuts have very similar nutritional breakdown to things like corn or brown rice. They're mostly starch. Um, and so there's basically like little nuggets of bread falling from the sky. And uh, chestnuts are really great for bringing people to your farm, especially bringing people of different backgrounds. A lot of um, uh, this uh, picture in the bottom left is from a farm in Ohio that I visited and a lot of immigrant communities who, are, who also share a huge heritage with chestnuts uh, are very interested um, in these. And so it's really, I love how chestnuts have this ability to bring lots of different cultures together. Um, and of course, uh, you can do great like agritourism and make uh, gluten-free um, products with them, as well as just eating them fresh or eating them roasted. And so next I wanna talk about um, hazelnuts. 
Hazelnuts are also found across the temperate North hemisphere. There's about 30 different species in the Corallus genus. And um, of, of most importance, probably like economically, I'd say, is Corallus avalana, the, what well, is the European hazelnut. But there's lots of other hazelnut species that are being really important, uh, being used in different breeding efforts, as well as for wild harvesting efforts. So hazelnuts, growing hazelnuts in the Northeast has like the opposite problem of growing chestnuts in the Northeast. With chestnuts, we had imported um, fungal disease. Growing um, in, what the challenge is for hazelnuts is that there is a, a, um, a fungal disease that is endemic, that is it's native to the Northeast. It's called the Eastern filbert blight. And the, the um, European hazelnut is extremely susceptible to this. It's also not very cold hardy for the Northeast. Um, so what we do in producing hybrid hazelnuts is we're trying to take the best uh, qualities of both of these plants and combine them into a single one. So we want the cold hardiness and the um, disease resistance from the American species, that's Corallus avalana and Corallus cornuta. And we want to take the nut production qualities from Corallus avalana and put, and put them into a single plant. And so you can see just like phenotypically, um, these look like an intermediate between um, the wild American and the more cultivated types, but there's a huge diversity. Um, we can also get ones that look more like this. This comes from Twisted Tree Farm in Spencer, New York. And these have more like uh, more European quality to them. And if you're interested in growing hazelnuts for commercial purposes, you definitely wanna be more aiming for this kind of, um, kind of plant. Again, you can, um, uh, well, hazelnuts are also like chestnuts, very well adapted to a variety of conditions. Hazelnuts probably are more forgiving and they can tolerate a whole wide variety of soils and slopes. They produce pretty well on even marginal land, huge variety of pHs. You just wanna avoid planting them in like very, very, very soggy soils. And you also, if you plant them near forests, probably with any nut tree, you're gonna have, uh, you know, rodent issues. Um, definitely protect them with fencing. These are pretty common though for many like agricultural plantings in general. Very similar to chestnut seedlings are great if you're interested in wildlife and non-commercial uses, uh, also for pollination purposes. Um, what's great about uh, seedlings is that they are very affordable. You can basically plant a whole forest for free and you get a great variety of things. You get a variety of plant sizes, plant phenology, yields, um, and there's a variety of uh, Eastern filbert, filbert blight resistance. So if you're interested in doing your own breeding, uh, seedlings are a really great source of genetic diversity. But if you're more interested in producing, um, in growing hazelnuts for a profit, you're definitely gonna wanna look more towards clones. And uh, the hybrid clone possibilities are just getting better and better every day. There's actually so much work being done on breeding hybrid hazelnuts, both in like the upper Midwest and like Wisconsin, Minnesota, but there's also um, some great collaborations between Oregon State University. Oregon produces 95% of the U.S.'s hazelnuts um, and Rutgers University in New Jersey. And so uh, this picture here is of a very recent uh, release from the Oregon State and Rutgers a collaboration. It's called The Beast, which is kind of a funny name. Uh, it's a hybrid hazelnut. And one of the lineages of this hazelnut is um, George Slate's New York 616 um, Slate variety. So that's really cool. Um, Cornell's previous work is still having an impact today. Um, there's also a really great selection coming out of Cortland, New York. Uh, by uh, Z's Nutty Ridge, uh, Jeff and, and Don Zarnowski have been doing hazelnut breeding on their farm for like decades. And um, they have a recent production called Nitka. And I wanted uh, this quality about it that it's about one gram and, only, and half of it is kernel by weight are really, really excellent metrics. Um, those match pretty much like some of the top producing or top performing um, European hazelnuts. So it's really it's sort of so amazing that they, they were able to find this and produce this tree and they've um, they've registered it. It's now, you know, in, in production. And I also just want to point out real quick. So we like we love to see that. And if you're looking a uh, really challenging thing or interesting thing about hazelnuts is that you need to have like chestnuts. You have to have different cultivars pollinating each other. But with hazelnuts, some 
cultivars are incompatible with each other. And so they have these things called S alleles. Uh, I'm not gonna get too much into the genetics of it, but when you're looking at hazelnut cultivars, you're gonna see this nomenclature, uh, this uh, S with an underlined number. And basically you wanna make sure that whatever cultivars you're matching on your farm, the number that's underlined is not the same between those two different cultivars. So you need diversity. Diversity is very important. So just make sure you study, study, study uh, your um, plant material. This is the picture of that Nitka. I'm growing it in one of my field experiments. And it was just a beautiful nut. Uh, my trees produced nuts for the first time this year. They're only three years old. They didn't make very many, but they made some. And we love to see this small husk. It's very easy for processing. And you can see how thin the shell was. I was able to crack this with my own teeth very easily, which is really great. Um, and that's what the nut looks like. It's a very small pellicle or skin. So like this nut is gonna be awesome for um, commercial production in the Northeast. So really grateful for the work that Jeff and Don have been doing over the last like 30 years. Uh, very similar to chestnut production, uh, you want to have pollinizing uh, trees surrounded by your cultivars and make sure that your cultivars have a, the, you, you're checking for S allele incompatibility. Of course, if you're just planting seedlings, all like hybrid seedlings, that's not an issue because they're not cultivars. You're gonna have intense genetic diversity throughout. So that's really good. Eastern filbert blight, as I talked a lot about before, is the main um, challenge in growing hazelnuts. And that's, and really the growing the hybrid um, cultivars or hybrid selections mostly uh, checks for that. So make sure you're choosing time-tested plant material. And if you have any plants that do have it, get rid of them, they're not worth keeping. This is what the, the symptoms look like. They look like little like black footballs. Um, they're little pustule, fungal pustules, that, uh, and they'll, they will totally kill the plant. So just get rid of them. Hazelnuts are pretty easy. They don't have a lot of like particular insect pests. A lot of common stuff like Japanese beetles were a big issue for me this year. There is the issue of big bud mite, which is not a major pest yet, but it is present in the Northeast. We're still learning how to manage it. Um, and the, there is a weevil even for hazelnuts, but it's, it's really um, west of the Rockies. So it's not an issue here, at least yet. Hopefully it won't be. Your biggest issue if you grow hazelnuts will be your vertebrates. Um, the, the, the chipmunks and the, and the corvids, especially the blue jays, they love hazelnuts and they're both smart and they will, they will, they will go to town. So make sure you have ways of, of dealing with those. There's also, you know, here's a simplified uh, value chain for um, hazelnuts. They gotta be harvested, dried, and dehusked. And then you can do a variety of different things after them. Um, they're not really like nuts in the shell, like different than chestnuts. Chestnuts are very, uh, they're sold fresh. They have a very thin shell. Um, and that's very typical to how they're eaten. Other like more hard shelled nuts, People aren't really used to or like really wanting to like crack them one by one. And so while that's probably the easiest way to produce them, you'll probably get the highest return on investment if you actually do some processing, uh, making different kinds of like spreads and butters, confections, or you can press them for oil. The oil can be used for uh, culinary oil or also biofuels. Uh, that's pretty much what this is saying here. And so I wanna complicate or like bring some more data into that, that earlier picture I had before of the United States where it looked like in the Northeast, there's really nothing going on. There actually is so much. And this is what I call the network. Um, and there's so many really amazing folks working on um, making better nut trees all across the Northeast and the Mid-Atlantic and the Midwest. Um, I think that nuts really have a bright future, even though we kind of saw a long period um, you know, in like the, basically from the thirties until to today, there's been like really not much interest. Uh, I think that nuts have a really bright future because of what's going on. So some other folks who are working on, on, uh, on nuts are, there's a really cool collective called the Nutty Buddy Collective in Asheville, North Carolina. They are a loose collection of enthusiasts who are working with landowners who have excess land and producing like 99 year leases to grow nut trees. They're producing hickory nut oil from bitter nut hickories, which you can't eat, but you can, but you can eat their oil because you can't eat them because their tannins are so high, but the tannins are only water soluble. 
And so if you extract the oil, you, you know, kind of sidestep that challenge and you kind of take advantage of a really amazing and underutilized food source. And they're doing really cool things with acorns, making acorn flowers. And I love the jokes that they have, Quaker Oaks. Um, it's just, it's really great to see like young people being funny with this stuff. There's also folks um, in the Mid-Atlantic, silviculture who have a goal to plant 1 million nut trees in the uh, Mid-Atlantic region. Um, and you can check them out on the internet. Uh, they're doing really cool things. They're having a big chestnut festival this year. And they're, they're also working with a cooperative model. And then as I mentioned before, I don't actually, I don't know if I mentioned this, but in New York State, there's a, an emerging um, cooperative. They're, they've already established themselves like legally as a cooperative uh, called NITCA. And this is um, Jeff Zarnowski who produced the, the, the hazelnut cultivar called NITCA. And they're, uh, they're a nut producers cooperative and marketing cooperative here in central New York. And they're focused on, they're all really passionate about you know, ecological production of, of nut trees. Uh, they're, they're definitely seeking uh, membership. So if you are a potential uh, nut grower here, I would definitely reach out to them at nitka.org. That's N-Y-T-C-A.org. Um, the people in them are have been doing this for decades and have you know, so much experience, not only producing nuts, but also with on-farm breeding. And they're also uh, like really looking and experimenting. And they've recently gotten this oil press and they, were, they are expanding into a commercial space and looking at expanding, applying for grants. So it's actually a really, really exciting area for growth. If you were in the New York area, definitely check them out. And I'm hoping, and then here are some of the um, different folks who are doing like more formal, formal research um, in the Midwest. This is called, this up here is the, it's called the Upper Midwest Hazelnut Development Initiative. And they're really focused, they're really focusing on developing hazelnuts for the particular climate of the Upper Midwest. So they need like super cold hardy um, and they have very particular soils out there. As I mentioned before, Michigan State University is doing a lot of great work in chestnuts. Rutgers is doing a really amazing job uh, breeding hazelnuts for the mid-Atlantic. Unfortunately, there's not really being a lot of testing done up here for their, uh, with their cultivars. And a lot of their cultivars are um, maybe probably not cold hardy enough for our region. Um, and then of course, the Center for Agroforestry at the University of Missouri is an amazing place uh, for all kinds of agroforestry work and doing a lot of different breeding on chestnuts and black walnuts. and uh, doing different like silo pasture experiments and um, all different kinds of agroforestry work. And um, I'm really, I'm hoping that Cornell will, will kind of pick up the pace. Uh, currently I am, I think one of the only people doing active nut research at Cornell. Um, and I'm not sure what will happen after I go. There has been a legacy of, of Cornell's involvement. Um, and I think that Cornell is very well poised to continue um, making progress for the for the Northeast, because right now there isn't any major research institution doing anything for the Northeast in terms of nut breeding, developing markets, working with farmers. So if you're in cooperative extension in the audience, uh, I'd love to talk with you later, or you know maybe we can work together on developing an action plan. And just a little bit about what I'm doing in my particular work in my PhD, is these are the three different questions that I'm really asking is, and, and much of which I've kind of talked to you about today. Um, what is the historical significance of nut trees in New York State? And I've taken you through some of those uh, stories. I'm also um, interviewing and doing surveys with Cooperative Extension and nut growers and non-nut growers in the state to talk about who, where, how, and why are people um, growing nuts, despite the fact that you know important institutions like Cornell are not really engaged in developing this uh, sector of the agriculture industry. And then part of my work is also looking at the actual mechanics of how do we grow these trees better? I'm just, I'm doing some field experiments on uh, orchard establishment variables and also trying to quantify um, like biomass carbon sequestration um, in chestnuts in particular, uh, even though it's a picture of hazelnuts, um, I'm working on chestnuts. And so to see if we can make some, so how much carbon can we use could we actually sequester if we were to scale up, you know, in this case, uh, chestnut production across the state. So, you know, we have had this um, 
kind of going back to what some of we talked about before in that in the in the 1910s we saw intense uh, deforestation and a lot of that has now come back today a lot of farms have sort of like regenerated their forests and that's really great uh, we really want to see this but I also want to wonder if we can like perhaps steer the direction of this reforestation. Can we, can we shape the way that forests come back so that they're not just forest forests, but that they're possibly also food forests that not only produce food, but also help combat climate change. And so can we go beyond um, this, this transition maximum? Can we expand the amount of forest in our area um, that also is productive for food? In New York State, there's 1.7 million acres of underutilized land. That's like a seventh of the entire landmass of New York State. And so just 3% of that, if we were to take this idle scrubland, is 51,000 acres. That's a huge amount. And right now, it's not really being used at all. It's not land that has been reforested. It's just like scrub idle land or even just the grassland. And so agriculture in the state is facing a lot of issues. Um, climate change is really challenging some of the very classic things that are grown here, like corn and apples. Uh, the video that's being shown is from a really a major uh, late spring frost that happened, I believe, is 2012 or maybe it was 2014, that destroyed about half of the apple crop. And this year has been really challenging from all the rain uh, for like vegetable production, but it's been a great year, a fantastic year for nut trees. Like, I don't know if you've seen the black walnuts, but they are just like doing amazing this year. Um, and so I think that we had to think a little bit differently about the way that we use our land, especially if we have land that's being naturally reforested. Like, do we have an opportunity to steer this reforestation to something that, you know, can benefit people and the planet at the same time? And so I just want to like roll this idea in people's heads, some back of the envelope calculations. So going back to that slide about underutilized land, you know, 51,000 of those acres was just in like scrub, idle, unused land. So let's say it's like half of that. That's like 1.5% of the underutilized land at a, you know, average yield of 2,000 pounds of chestnuts per acre per year at, you know, this is a kind of very conservative estimate of $5 per pound. In the first 20 years alone, that's is like after we reach, um, in the first 20 years of, of production. Oh no, sorry, this is the first 20 years of planting. And so half of that is in production. We could have like two and a half billion dollars of gross revenue. Now this is like a, you know, of course, like a very um, back of the envelope calculation. It's not accounting for costs, but this like is a really encouraging sign. We could be, we could be um, stimulating a really important part of the agricultural um, industry that could help revitalize rural, rural landscapes. Be giving lots of people jobs, storing carbon, making a really high quality food source, um, making use of underutilized land, just a tiny fraction of underutilized land. So I think that nuts have a huge, huge potential in that way. So folks are thinking about that book tree crops again in a future light, in a new light rather, you know, can we use those same concepts from the past to help uh, create a more sustainable future? And part of this um, is about not only producing food, but helping to draw down excess carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And tools like reforestation and crops and trees and cropland are some of the most powerful natural solutions we have. And I highlighted reforestation, it may be not the way that this publication intended it, but I am envisioning food forests. I'm envisioning forests of trees that produce food. And so maybe we can't get, you know, that that high 10 gigatons of carbon dioxide sequestered a year, but we can, maybe we can get four. And that would still be a huge uh, benefit. Um, natural climate solutions are just harnessing nature's ability, enhancing the already inherent natural ability for um, natural systems, natural terrestrial systems to store carbon um, in their biomass and in soils. And while it's not going to save the planet, we still have to mitigate fossil fuel, you know, burning and, and carbon emissions in the first place. 
it can provide a major chunk of our uh, solution approach. And I really believe that agroforestry has a major role to play in this. And if you're new to agroforestry, agroforestry can take a, um, a variety of different forms. Agroforestry, as, you, as I've talked about already, is a very ancient, uh, ancient practice. Um, and has a more, more modern study. You know, agroforestry is really the modern uh, study of the inclusion of trees and shrubs in agricultural landscaping. And we can incorporate it in a variety of different forms. Um, a lot of these, you can find out more on the Cornell Small Farms um, agroforestry webpage. And, I, uh, you know, I believe that, you know, we have choices to make as we uh, use land. I think humans really are gonna to have to come to grips with what are we doing and what do we want for the future? So this picture comes from uh, the chestnut orchard in Ohio that I've, that I've talked a lot about. Um, and one of, uh, one of his fields is next to this fracking water storage. And uh, one day, one of the trucks accidentally spilled all this fracking water um, on his land. And like in this dead zone that I have here in the picture, nothing is gonna grow there. Like he's not planting any trees, trees just won't grow, that soil is ruined. Um, and right next to it is the chestnut orchard. And so like, we just, we have this really important choice to make. How do we wanna use our land? What do we want our future to look like? How can we, how can we use trees to produce food and a future that is sustainable for us? And hopefully we can create farms that look like this, uh, that are, that follow natural landforms, that are multi-species integrated, different ages, um, yeah. And so this, this is an idea of like what agroforestry on a farmscape could possibly look like. This is perhaps what the future in New York State could be. And I think it's also really important to circle back around to how, you know, speaking of sustainability, we're gonna have to think about the ways in which agroforestry being something that is inherently an indigenous technology, how the, how the you know, the scientific and institutional study of agroforestry can either enhance or sometimes collide with our social justice goals. And I hope that we can take some deep thoughts and really think hard about, and I mean, not just think hard, but strategize how we can redouble our efforts to ensuring that whatever future work we do, especially if we're using native crops, even if they're just a part of you know, the species, we're also, we're always using native land. And so we need to think about how we can build better relationships as visitors, um, as uninvited visitors in this landscape. So, so I try to uh, think about some of this work. Uh, I try to think about some of this in the work that I do. Um, uh, I do some community engaged work with the Tuscarora Nation. That's where these pictures come from. Uh, not, uh, not processing, turning nuts into foods and also planting nut trees and other uh, fruit trees on uh, at the, the, the reservation school there. And so I hope that we can use agroforestry to help strengthen indigenous food sovereignty, uh, community health, and ultimately the rematriation of, of land. And I would wanna thank you all so much for, for listening, for tuning in, for being here. Um, feel free to share this, uh, chat about it. Um, I'm happy to stick around for a little bit for questions. I wanna give a shout out to um, all of my funders the American Indian and Indigenous Studies Program at Cornell, Engaged Cornell, um, the College of Agricultural Life Sciences, Phipps Conservatory of Agri uh, uh, Phipps Conservatory, and the USDA uh, funded a lot of my research. And I encourage you, if you're so, if you're into social media, please follow my work um, at Research Is Nuts is my handle. I, I am on uh, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And I also have some references, additional references for things that were not referenced in the actual um, presentation. And yeah, so please uh, revisit this when it's all done, check out my other webinar and I uh, really appreciate your um, presence here today. Thank you.
Thanks, Samantha. We have some appreciation coming in on the chat. And uh, I know there's more out there. It's a wonderful presentation, lots of great info and such a great perspective to take with us. Uh, sometimes we get lost in all the details, but to get that wide arc of, of nuts and to think about the potential for the future, I really appreciate that. So I'll encourage folks to uh, put your questions in the chat, or you're welcome to unmute yourself and say hello and ask a question. Um, you can do that by clicking on your, your little microphone icon. If you're on the phone, it's star six. But I do believe there are some I'm going to. Um... I, I'd, I'd like to jump in. Uh, Smith, thank you very much for the presentation. Eric Layton in here. Um, I'm in New York, but I'm actually a graduate student at University of Missouri in the Agroforestry Center. So I, I, I was happy to see that represented in this presentation. Um, I am very curious. Um, I have land here in, in New York. Um, I am really interested in um, sourcing some seed, seeds or, and or seedlings or chestnuts and or hazelnuts. And um, where does, what is the best, where is the best place to start that? Where, where could I find that? It's a great question. There's probably so many different sources. So I have, um, I do have a resource sheet I can connect you with in the other presentation I did, but off the top of my head, some um, really great uh, nurseries that um, I think are, are worth following is one Z's Nutty Ridge. If you want uh, hazelnuts that are adapted to like zones four and five, not sure where in New York you are. Um, Albany. The, in Albany, okay. Yeah, so Z's Nutty Ridge. If you want something closer to Vermont, there's a perfect circle farm. Uh, which has a little bit um, more cold hardy stuff. A lot of the farms I know of nurseries are more in central New York or the Finger Lakes region. So there's edible acres, a twisted tree. Those are some of the ones I can think of off the top of my head. If other people know of any here, like just like feel free to put them in the chat too. We can definitely crowdsource information. Did you say you have a, a resource sheet? Like if I emailed you, could that's something you could, is that something you've already compiled of yeah I have compiled a list yes I have compiled a little list of different nurseries I created a couple of years ago it might be outdated so if you are a nurseries person like definitely shoot me a message I'll I would love to include you um, but yes I can definitely link maybe when this um, when this recording gets posted on YouTube, or maybe if there's also a list of all the people who came, I can also send a link to the resource sheet as well as my other video, which goes more into the details about production. Yeah, I think actually maybe the easiest thing is at cornellagroforestry.org, we have already posted your other webinar and we could link to anything we wanted to link there as a way for people to find that. So I'll capture that on the recording that if you go to cornellagroforestry.org and go down to the nut section, we can put stuff there. Mm -hmm. Hi, um, Samantha. Um, can you tell us, um, uh, you know, how we can follow your work? Uh, if whether you are at uh, Cornell or elsewhere or wherever you are, uh, if we can continue to follow your work. Sure. Thank you for your question. So I am at Cornell. This is going to I'm hoping uh, everything goes according to plan. This is my last year, my Ph.D. And I don't, so I don't know where I'm going to be afterwards. Um, but if you want to keep it updated, I like to use social media for updates on my work. And I could put my handle in the chat right now. And so you can find me at Research is Nuts. Primarily on Instagram is the one I use the most, but also on Twitter. And if you don't, if you're not into social media, I would just say like, just Google my name. Uh, you'll find something stuff about me here and there, here and there. Oh, thank you so much. You're welcome. What about the scrubland? Um, I see. Uh, you know, I uh, browse on uh, property sales, and uh, many of them are um, sales of uh, land uh, by. Uh, people who have uh, who are heirs and their parents are not there anymore and many of them are scrublands you can see the scrub and I always thought what can you do with that and uh, I guess uh, you're because uh, these are drought resistant and uh, they don't need they need uh, soil drainage 
I guess uh, that would be good for the nut production. Yeah, that could be one. I mean, definitely, I, I don't want to make any kind of blanket statements that like, yes, all scrubland would be great for nuts. You definitely got to take a look at the soils. They might need a little bit of, of, of amendments or some plowing, or you might want to throw, you know, some calcium on there, depending on the situation, you know, what, what the soil situation is. But they, but nut trees are very resilient and are adapted to, to challenging soil conditions. And so especially chestnuts and hazelnuts um, in particular, I think could be good candidates um, for you know, marginal land in general. But of course you'd wanna make sure that the drain, you know, there's, you know, that the soil is drained well enough and that there's other, there's not other confounding factors, um, but yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. There's a question I found in the chat from earlier. I'm curious if you have any um, ideas if there's a cold hardy pecan that might be viable in zone four sections of the Northeast. I don't know in particular. I know that folks are very steadily pushing pecan north and I think that's really exciting. Um, you might try hybridizing pecan. I saw people have been uh, doing pecan and, and hickory uh, hybrids, and uh, that could be a potential source. I know that there is one of those at the Cornell Botanic Gardens. There's only one of them, so they don't really get well pollinated. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't know if particular if there's one cold hardy to, there are like Northern pecan trees. And I think really what you should do is just buy a hundred of them. If you have room for a hundred and plant them, and see what happens. You could be the one who produces it for us. But sorry, I did not have like such a specific direct answer. Okay. Any other questions? I'm looking, I think I got ones out of the chatter they were asked live which was great just a lot of kudos and thanks and appreciation for the work and that you're continuing that thread that thin thread through cornell of nut nut work and hopefully that will that will shine on into the future ken ken is actually doing the forest farming class um, from retirement this fall and we'll see if he continues but that's good so there'll be folks back in the nut grove which is great samantha um before we go um and i may connect with you offline because this may require a larger answer um but i i am really scratching my head here trying to figure out why nut production i mean i understand the blights and, and all that the biological issue but the 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 desire for the product hazelnut specifically um why that has fallen off and out of such disfavor in in the Northeast uh, historically. And I, I say that simply because at University of Missouri, when I started studying there, there's such an orientation towards nuts. And I, I, I was asking that question a year or so ago, like what, why is it that in the Northeast, we just have this void? And you, you touched on it a little bit, but I'm just wondering commercially, um, is it uh, developing a market uh, side of it is is it maybe that that there just isn't a market for it that culturally it's not something that people are interested in purchasing on mass i think that's definitely part of it um i guess that your question is particularly about hazelnuts did, did I hear that yeah question? just as a case in point i guess well i think it really matters about the nut in, in particular so what i think with hazelnuts is that hazelnuts were like never really a major food source as far as we as far as i know maybe as far as we know the american hazelnut um, while edible and while really important i don't think was ever exploited in like in huge quantities like we see with acorns and black walnuts um mostly because it just it doesn't grow in huge thickets uh, in huge stands um, and I don't think it has a same like level of production. So it could just, it, the hazelnuts in particular, it could be a cult, you know, a long standing cultural thing. Part of my hypothesis, and I'm not sure if this is true um, about this, like why nuts in general are not really favored in the Northeast is because I think that, I think this is a really a holdover um, from colonial preferences for that the forests were, were terrifying and were seen as a sad places of savagery. And uh, we were encouraged to cut down the trees and that um, 
and instead plant row crops. I'm not sure if this is true. This is sort of what I, it's one of my, my hypotheses, is like why in general in the Northeast um, that uh, not, like people don't enjoy nuts as much or don't seek them out as much. Um, definitely like markets are important in today's, in today's society. And, but I think hazelnuts have such, well, I think once there's enough production, I think that it's not gonna have a trouble. Like people like Nutella, who doesn't like amazing tasting like cooking <laughs> oil, um, people like, I think hazelnuts have no problem because they can just use them pretty much like any other nut. Um, but really the issue is like getting the pro like one of the hugest um, issues right now is like getting all the processing equipment, processing nuts for a market, especially in today's market where people don't want to crack nuts themselves. It's a huge, huge capital investment. And that's why it's really exciting to see some of these cooperatives emerging because they can pool their resources um, so they can buy the equipment, um, you know, much easier than they could individually. But it's a great question. I don't have a, I don't really have a good answer. I'd love to, I'd love to pick your brain about it more too. Oh, thank you. No, that's very, very good response. I definitely am going to take advantage of that. Thank you. <laughs> Get me in contact with you offline. I appreciate it. Yes. I saw a question about urban nut production. Um, this is a really great question. I don't know if I know particular examples of urban nut production, but I do know that there are a lot of urban food forests across the country, um, like in Seattle. I think there's some in Chicago, um, other places that's not my specialty. So I don't remember all the details, but uh, in particular, speaking of University of Missouri, um, Sarah Lovell, Dr. Sarah Lovell, um, has done some really awesome work on urban food forests. And I mean, I just like being in, like going to Atlanta once, I remember seeing so many pecan trees and I don't know if it's like urban food nut production or just that there's like nut trees around. And same thing here in Ithaca, New York, you can find nut you can find like black walnuts almost everywhere. There's a lot of, but they're not grown there on purpose. Um, but that's a really great question. Um, I would love to see urban nut farms or just nut parks. And we have some also, I don't know if the person on the, uh, who asked about hardy pecans, but uh, folks are, are suggesting Grimo nursery. That's another great nursery up in Ontario. Um, their stuff's pretty good, but I would not say, but since it's in Ontario, it's definitely like their zone is warmer than zone four, um, but a, a good place to start for genetics. And then yeah, Northern Iowa, Iowa along the Mississippi, I think too, that's a nice microclimate. Uh, finding pecans for zone four is gonna be challenging, but I think worth the, worth the trouble. We have someone also here contributing to the question about why nut production, why folks are interested in nuts, saying that the death of the American chestnut was a huge part of that. And I would probably totally agree. Um, it really just changed the landscape and I think shifted people's focus. And yeah, Cornell stopped funding research after Dr. Slate's work was done. And I think a huge part of it is that we just don't have, if we had more active research going on that the situation would be really different. So thanks for saying that, Lewis. Uh, someone's asking if we can do container nut trees with bonsai style, but extreme pruning. I would, uh, I don't really think so unless people develop dwarf rootstocks for the nut trees. These nut trees want to be huge and they typically have like gigantic tap roots. Um, chestnut trees need a little bit of pruning, but I don't think they want to be extremely pruned, but maybe that's something we just don't know about and you could experiment with. Another question is coming here about hickories. So besides hickory nut oil, is there a market for shag bark hickory? Our family farm has wanted to do shag barks in the center of most fields. They've been there for over a hundred years. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, I would just say probably you could try sell, selling them in shell. That would be the easiest for you as the farmer. You'll probably not get that many takers because people just don't really want to crack nuts these days. Um, so again, you'd have to invest in machinery to crack the shells and extract the nut meat. 
And then I think I, then I think the, the possibilities are endless. You know, you could just sell hickory nuts shelled, which would go for a huge price because no one else is doing that. And you've done like so much labor for the consumer. You could incorporate them into um, granola bars or ice creams or like, I just think that the possibilities are endless. Uh, I think I think having cracked out hickory nuts could be um, so awesome because they're so they taste so good. They're probably my favorite in terms of flavor, the native nuts here in the Northeast. <laughs> the vegans don't mind cracking nuts. Great. Yes, exactly. So um, yeah, so then there you go. So you um, Lydia, it looks like you have someone who wants to buy your hickory nuts. So you should connect with Asha. And um, I think you, the two of you could start something great. Okay, so nutcracking machinery. Yeah, there's a lot I could say about this. I have some more information um, in my other webinar, but what I'll say, it can range from anything from like a stone and a hammer to really fancy equipment that costs like tens of thousands of dollars. Um, so it really depends on what your goals are. There's also like really intermediate ones and there's also handmade ones. So um, something called the Dave built nutcracker is cost $200. It's hand cranked. You could probably like uh, uh, modify it for a drill. Um, you could also, there's also a nutcracker. Uh, there's, yeah, I mean, I would just suggest like, it's that's such a big question. Um, there are folks who are, who are making them on the internet. People use their cars to run over as someone just uh, um, said in the in the chat, that's a very common way to do it. But there are, um, there's DIY methods. I would just go to YouTube and be like Nutcracker, DIY Nutcracker or like, you know, home scale Nutcracker and you'll get so many, um, so many different options. I guess I'd like to, you know, like make space for just any final questions. Otherwise, it seems like maybe folks are ready to go on the rest of their day. Yeah, and just as a reminder, we'll post the recording probably within a week to Cornell Agroforestry as well as the Small Farms Program YouTube channel. So you can search either of those to find it and share it with others. And hopefully we can all get cracking on some nut stuff. So thanks so much for sharing. It was wonderful. Thank you all so much. Hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Take care all.